Hey Daniel, are you ready to start today's episode? Absolutely, but not until you say the secret password. Why do I have to say the secret password? Because today's episode is about secret societies. Listen, I don't even know about the password. I sent it to you in an email with the instructions for the secret handshake. Oh my gosh, that's what that was? Okay, let's just start the show. Not until you say it. Oh my gosh. Asparagus? Now do the handshake. Oh my gosh, stop. Hi everyone, welcome to Read, Return, Repeat. I'm your co-host, Sarah Dixon. And I'm Daniel Wee Wardy, your other co-host. And today's co- topic is Category 11, a book about a secret or closed society. And we're interviewing editor of the graphic novel American Cult, Robin Chapman. Born in Alaska, Robin studied at the Savannah College of Art and Design. She's worked in the indie comic industry as an artist, publisher, and printer of comics, including Sourpuss, Matching Jackets, and the zines Hay and Four Eyes. American Cult is a comic anthology featuring works by multiple writers and authors that tracks the history of cults in America, starting at 1694 until today. It features the works of Lara Antal, Brian Brown, and Rosa Colaguera. Robin edited the anthology and wrote the foreword, as well as one of the stories within. Robin is joining us today from Brooklyn. Let's say hi. All right. Hello. Hey, nice to meet you. Hello. We're really excited to have you on uh, our show today. Um, yeah, let's, let's yeah, jump into yeah, the Yeah, I'm excited to talk about the book. Robin, welcome. Tell us about this book. Why did you want to do a project on cults? Um, well, this book is called American Cult. It's a nonfiction comic anthology about religious, religious cults in America throughout the years. Um, and I wanted to do it because I think cults are really fascinating. They, um, I kind of, I've always, I've been a true crime fan for a while and sort of the same things that draw me to true crime are kind of the same things that draw me to stories about cults, just really kind of unbelievable, true stories about people that are living an experience I've never experienced. Um, and often there is a crime aspect in these in these cult stories, not always, but often. Um, so I think that's what first drew me to like the idea of like, what about a book that collects a bunch of true stories about cults in America? Um, and I also thought it was something people would be interested in because um, people are really drawn to these stories for some of the same same reasons I am. Um, so what I would, was like throwing the idea around, like my friends were like, that's cool. And do you know about this cult? Do you know about this cult? And um, and so it seemed like there was something there folks could would be interested in. Um, and I and I love nonfiction comics in general. Um, I, at my day job, I'm an editor at First Second and I handle a lot of our nonfiction I, I love nonfiction podcasts. I, I love documentaries. I just like learning <laughs> about um, things through podcasts and documentaries and comics. So that's uh, that's sort of what what gave me the spark of the idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was um, a lot of it that I didn't know about. I wouldn't say that I'm like a cult knowledge house. Can you say that? Can I say I'm a knowledge house? But I'm not one when it comes to cults. Yeah. Um, there was a lot I didn't even, yeah, like I knew a lot of the heavy hitters, but I wasn't, yeah, like, but it was like, it was crazy to think that they start, they, they, they've been in America as long as America's been America. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Now in your introduction, um, you go through like the four different criteria that you considered for this book to make, like call them a cult. Um, Can you walk our listeners through those criteria and how they applied um, in this book? Sure. And I'm just going to actually open the book and look at it to remind myself of, (laughs) of what I I wrote. Um, And thanks for emphasizing these. This is my own personal belief about cults. This is how, this is how I define them. And I'm just a lay person. Um, I'm an, I'm not an expert, but I have like, you know, read a lot of books, watched a lot of documentaries. I, um, and so I know a thing or two, but I'm just, I'm not a academic or, or an expert. Um, a knowledge I, house. <laughs> I might be a knowledge house. Um, yeah. So I, I broke down like four aspects that I thought 
defined a cult and that I wanted to be present um, in all the groups that we covered in this book. And the first one's kind of a, a basic, it's a group, you know, the, the first, the first criteria. So this is a group, um, though it's better described as maybe a community or even a family, like a, a sense of belonging is really vital to a cult. So you have this, this community, this family. So that's, that's one. And two is this one's pretty important to me that these are totalitarian groups. Um, that's kind of what differentiates these from a lot of what you might call mainstream religions, um, that there, there is a leader or leaders of, of the, of these groups that control the members' lives in a sort of like overwhelming and way. Um, so that, yeah, so there's, it's their authoritarian, their totalitarian, um, and three, uh, the members have a shared belief system. And so that this one's important too, because I think sometimes when uh, people talk about cults, they don't sort of appreciate that um, what brings people to a cult is often like a belief system that they hold dear. They're like not, um, it's just not kind of random that they ended up in this cult, unless perhaps you were born into it, or maybe your partner was a member. And so you joined for that reason. But usually a person seeks out a group, a cult, like, like, um, because they are looking for a higher meaning in their life. They're, they're looking for a higher truth and they find a group that like, um, resonates with them. They're like, Oh, this, this makes sense to me. Um, so there's a sh shared belief system, uh, within the group. And then four, um, and this one's really important too, uh, that they, this group does not conform to cultural norms. They're outside the mainstream. They're, uh, they challenge the mainstream. So that's for me, what, uh, what, one of the things that differentiates it from a, a, a religion, a, a different religion that might be small and it might be new. Um, but if it's, if it lives well within the mainstream, I wouldn't call it a cult. So yeah, cult, it challenges the mainstream. A cult is totalitarian. Um, yeah, that those are that's what it, what for me kind of are the two things that make it different from some of the other religions that are more mainstream and accepted. Yeah. I mean, I think when you, when we, when you go through each of the stories, um, which we're going to dive into in a little bit, but I, that, that was very clear that you, they were, you were intentional and in how you applied those criteria. Yeah. Cause cult is a heavy word, right? Like mm -hmm. I did want to use it though. You know, some folks who, especially those who study these groups academically will use the term, a uh, new religious movement and NRM. Um, and is that again, say that again, new religious movement and RM. Okay. Pretty sure I got that. Yeah. Pretty got sure it. I've got that right. Um, or they might use the word sect, um, or group, which is, which is fine. But for me, I was talking about a certain kind of religion that was totalitarian did have, um, you know, this, this, uh, this leader that, or leaders or like, um, that was controlling the members' lives in a way that really, um, was, was like outside the norms, um, and, and kind of abusive, um, and that these groups were, were not accepted in society. Um, but, uh, yeah. So like for me, like with the word cult, it is, it's a, it's a, like, it's a heavy word, but it, we're talking about something that is like a specific thing that is dark often. And it is, you know, yeah. So like that, that was the word I wanted. I think it's important that like, um, cause you kind of deal. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was important to have that at the beginning. So you can like kind of use it as a reference as reading the book and like, Oh, cause there were some things I didn't really think I won't get into it yet, but there was some in the like cults in the book that I didn't really think were cults until I read it. And then I kind of looked, read it and I was like, Oh, that makes sense why they would think that's a cult. So that was, yeah. And I'm like, which one? Yeah. 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 So I, I shared the criteria with the contributors and basically I, they, they made the case that they thought this ah. group was a cult. And, um, I, you know, and some of them, I, I don't know if I disagree with anybody, but there's some that I wouldn't have like gone to first thinking, oh, let's, let's do, let's, let's make a big list of cults. Like, um, because maybe like whether they're like have this, uh, authoritarian nature to them or not is sort of iffy. Um, and whether they're inside or outside of the mainstream is kind of iffy. Um, 
but uh, I thought like, you know, if, if the, if the authors of these, of the author of the story did their research and they're making a good case and I don't think it's flat wrong, I was usually like, okay, we'll include it in. So to elaborate more on the collaboration, like, uh, how did it come together? Did you plan on it being a collaborative project? And like, did you invite artists or like have an open call or did you just like work with artists and writers you already knew? And like, so, mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah. I, d- I did always know it would be an anthology. Um, that, that would kind of, that would sort of be the nature of this kind of book. I, I certainly couldn't like write and draw the whole thing. It would take me my whole lifetime. I'm very, I'm a very slow cartoonist. So, um, I needed a number of contributors and I've done some anthologies in the past. So it just made sense this, that this project would be an anthology. And for how I reached out to the contributors, um, a lot of them, I, I, uh, were, were, uh, cartoonists I knew and I sought them out. Like I was trying to do, I was trying to seek out my favorite nonfiction cartoonists. So like, um, Brian Box Brown, like was top of mind. Um, and, uh, but once I did a Kickstarter, that's how I did my fundraising for the project. Um, that, that was kind of when the project became more public instead of just something I was doing and talking about with my friends and my like cartooning community. Once it, there was a Kickstarter, um, folks started reaching out to me, sometimes folks I knew and, and sometimes folks I didn't. Um, so it was, it was, it was, a, it was a mixed bag. I, I, I did, I probably, I think I seeked out most of the talent in the book but there's maybe a fourth of the book that's made up with um creators who sought me out and usually um the cartoonists they came with a group in mind that they wanted to cover and sometimes i'd have to say oh we already have that group covered can you pick someone else um sometimes i was seeking people out and i was saying hey would you cover this because i really want this group in the book um so, but uh, for the most part, the, the cartoonists involved picked the group they wrote about. Often they were pretty, often they, they were like, they wanted to write about this group. Uh, it was this group or nothing. Um, yeah. Like so, everyone yeah. had, oh, like, oh, so every, oh, like everyone like has their own cult, right? Like, is that kind of like, it's like a fun fact, you know, about a specific cult. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if a lot of that was happening. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like this, but um, but some were picking groups that are really um not the like you know top ten famous cults or anything obscure groups I had never heard of. Um, everybody had their own reason for for writing about a group, and two of the authors were writing about their lived experience in these groups. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So like so obviously the the reason for them talking about those groups was you know made sense. It was obvious. Uh, but for for the other folks, they either just found the story fascinating and always wanted to dig in more, or maybe they had some sort of connection to it. Maybe they grew up where this, this group was. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, just they, like, maybe they, you know, um, are history buffs and like some, some aspect of the, the cult related to a, a part of history they're really interested in. Um, yeah. So like, yeah, most folks had came with, with something they wanted the story they really wanted to cover. And I did too. I did Heaven's Gate. And that's that's a cult that I find really fascinating. Um, and yeah, I, I picked it for my own reasons, but that was the one I wanted to do. Um, yeah, there was a lot that I didn't know about. I did not know. I mean, you know, some of them I know. I knew, I remembered Heaven's Gate because I mean, I was alive and I remember seeing that on the news. Um, but like, I didn't know about Jonestown. I feel like I should know about Jonestown. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I had certainly heard of Jonestown because it's just boggling when you hear about the, how many people died. It's hard to wrap your mind around. It's such a, such a tragedy, such a massacre. Um, yeah, it almost seems unreal. I never thought about people not knowing about it, but like growing up, like, um, I would just hear my parents refer to things as Jonestown. And then I found out later, like, um, my the church my parent my mom's family was from is what jones said like uh the oh. the people's church broke out oh. from. so like wow so it was like and so yeah that was kind of yeah just hearing you guys like being like oh they don't know about johnson was like oh that's crazy so is that one of the ones that's still around uh, that was also like mind-boggling to me that people that they a lot of them met these awful ends 
you know, the people involved. Um, and then there's still like sections of these religions existing in the world. I don't recall hearing that there was a, a Jonestown, like that some, some form of Jonestown or the, um, that church still exists. It could be okay. though. I think, okay. um, yeah, but I remember like, you know, there's still, um, I think there's still a, a group, um, connected to Waco. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, there are, you know, there are some folks who, who didn't, um, who were, are survivors of Heaven's Gate or weren't involved in the suicides. And they, um, you know, a lot of these folks, they still really hold these beliefs true. Um, and, and there's like the Source family, which is another group that was covered in the, in the anthology. And, um, a lot of the folks in that group, they, they keep, they kept their cult name for the rest of their life and they still really live by some of the, the, um, values, um, and practices that they, they took on in the group. Um, yeah. So that's, that sometimes happens. Now, was it an artistic choice to print in black and white? One of our team asked that question and, you know, it's like, oh yeah, because a lot of the art lent itself really well to a black and white, um, format. I think first it was a financial choice. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just, it's cheaper to make a black and white book. You can print it domestically pretty cheaply. Um, so we printed the first, uh, the first edition, um, the first print run in Canada. Uh, but color printing is so expensive yeah. that um, you pretty much need to do it overseas. And that adds a whole nother complication. Um, but yeah, I think it also, also I come from a, I've been in a, the, the small press comic scene for, for since the nineties. So for quite a while, and I've, I've been involved in some anthologies and, and back then color printing was so expensive that black, black and white was pretty normal for the small press. Um, so it just seemed, it just seemed like the obvious choice. It's, it's, uh, and it seemed like it did lend itself well to like these nonfiction stories. Um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, there's, these are dark stories. Like the, was also a choice like if you if you look at the cover it has this black background and this like vivid red like um yeah so the those were colors that just came to mind when I wanted to do this book I I I did want sort of a um a darker looking palette it worked well yeah we were just like oh well maybe there was a a purpose to that so uh yeah I haven't like yeah it just reminded me, like, I, I'm, like, older, so, like, I remember reading indies, and every indie comic was in black and white mm-hmm. back in the day, so it was kind of, like, just reminded me of that, and go, going back to the roots of like, <laughs> how I used to, like, read. You mentioned um, in the intro that people who join cults aren't brainwashed, but people united under a shared belief system. Um, there's still a humanity underlying all these stories. Cult leaders aren't pure evil and followers aren't total sheep. Why is it important that we see the humanity in these people, even people like Fred Phelps and Jim Jones? I guess um, well, I, I just think that whenever you're doing journalism or nonfiction writing, like um, especially about um, a crime, like, you know, true crime fiction or true crime um you know, journalism, that sort of thing. Uh, I think you have to take care not to, um, like sort of make it all about the scandal of the, of the story. Like, I I know that that can draw a lot of attention and can be kind of sexy and make people excited and maybe get more people to, you know, tune into your, your show. But like, um, it, yeah, I don't think it's super ethical to like always be searching for the scandal of these stories. Like these are real life tragedies with humans, um, real life humans who some of them are still around today feeling the trauma of, of these uh, of these experiences. And for you to be sort of utilizing their trauma as a form of entertainment um, and even maybe a, a, a form uh, like a way of like earning money, <laughs> like that's like a that's wrong. You know, that's not there. Yeah. Uh, true crime, uh, can, is some, sometimes, uh, um, yeah, it, there, there's some problems with true crime, with the true, true crime genre. Um, and, uh, I, as a fan of the true crime, true crime genre, I've always been, I guess I've been aware of it when I've uh, listening to podcasts or watching documentaries. And I, I did, I knew what, there was a path I wanted to follow where, um, like, we understand these people as people, as humans, um, and that we're 
we're interested in the humanity of the story um in not just the you know the the sex and the gore and the scandal like that's um that's very dehumanizing uh so um yeah so i guess i i, I knew that if i wanted to do this project i had to do it right um because it just felt like that it'd be unethical to do it otherwise um, and unfortunately, a lot of what is written about cults or what you see on TV does kind of chase that that scandal aspect and um, does like belittle every person involved and um, does like really not take in the uh, into consideration the trauma experienced by the families that are still surviving and the, the people that are involved in these stories. Um, so, yeah, I guess, that, yeah, that's that's what I was trying to do. And I, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, I was just thinking while you were talking, the, the, I have a thing where I, I will look for, even when somebody does something really bad and awful, and I, maybe this is because I'm a librarian and like, as a, a librarian, I think that we have empathy on like another level than normal people, but I always look for like the meaning behind their actions, right? Even if they did something really bad, I find the meaning so I can better understand it and process it. And I feel like maybe that's what you were doing, or that's how I took the the book and the stories. Because even if you're not excusing their behavior, right, they did some pretty heinous things, but you're trying to find out why. And sometimes mm-hmm. that helps you with processing your feelings about it. I don't know. Maybe I'm off base but that's how I just I think that's how I take it yeah no I don't I don't think you're off base I I agree like empathy is like important to me as just a individual like it's something I think about a lot and I think when you're um when you have empathy you get closer to the truth like Mm -hmm. um like yeah the like I'm looking for something I'm looking for the truth here um not a story where there's a a villain who's 100% evil and there's a hero who's 100% good that's that's right. that's not the way reality is i think um when you have empathy yeah you're getting closer to the truth i yeah i think empathy and when looking at groups from the outside i think it's always important and you, you i think it was you guys did a really good uh, approach to that because it seems like even now like you'll see like how people report on different countries or like, I don't like, I always have this opinion. Like I don't live in that country, so I'm not going to like pass judgment on like what's going on in China. Cause I haven't been to China. I don't live in China. And so, and like, you realize that's just kind of built into how people perceive things. And I think it's having it be really like, especially with cults, you just trying to like look and try to understand them from a human perspective is important. So. Yeah. And I think on the, on the flip side, you know, a lot of these stories, and you said that a couple of your contributors were actually telling their lived experience, but I feel like more of them than just a couple had that kind of, you know, this was my experience perspective. Mm -hmm. Like even Jonestown was like, this Mm -hmm. was our story. And, um, and then there was the one, uh, where the, uh, the author's name matched the, uh, the, the person in the story. So I was like, Oh, I know that they're telling a true story. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was really, important to have that inside perspective on how people were taken in by these cults right um and i don't know i mean i i was going to ask you if this alters our perspective of these groups but i think we've already discussed that it does um so can you tell us more about like was it therapeutic to write these stories? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, I just, I thought it was really, really interesting approach and it helped me again, empathize better. Ah, man, I'm, I'm struggling with this question, but I really liked it. Let's talk about it. Thanks. Well, um, (laughs) I'm trying to like, could you repeat the question? Cause I think I got a little lost. I think I didn't really even give you a question. (laughs) I was like, you did this thing and I liked it. Let's talk about it. Um, so the, the insider perspective, the insider perspective, you know, that choice of, of making Jonestown be about the, the people that were involved and that were, that lost their lives as a result Mm -hmm. of this experience, um, was heaven's gate an insider's perspective? No, that one wasn't. No, Um, I think a lot of the cartoonists in the anthology just naturally, we're drawn to telling the story from an inside perspective. And I think that makes sense because otherwise it, it kind of feels, uh, I don't know, very like dry and, mm-hmm. um, an academic, like um, to 
get to the story of it because uh, they are look they are telling a story. They, it's, it's not just uh, that we're we're sharing these interesting facts about something that happened. It's like to make this an interesting comic. It's got, it has to have a beginning, middle, and end, and it's a lot easier to do that when you have a character. Um, and I think they naturally thought of a character on the inside. Um, and so for you know, two of the authors, uh, Jesse Lambert and Lonnie Mann, are, are writing about their own experience. So obviously uh, they're, they're, they are writing about um, their firsthand experience. So that, that makes sense. And then for Jonestown, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the the writer did have an uncle who died in Jonestown. So I, the story was, um, or a family member at least. Uh, so that story was very personal to them. Um, but in the other case, I think that um, it was just the natural way to tell a good story, to tell a story of someone in this group from their perspective. And also some of the research that um, they've done about these these groups. Sometimes they're reading biographies of, of people who have, um, you know, escaped the group or survived the group. And in that case, it just made sense to like tell that story. Well, it was very impactful because um, I, I mean, I, yeah. I was really kind of taken aback and I think I had to put the book down because I was just like, I had to sit with it for a little while. Um, yeah, I, I, I like the, the, I like the variation from like a uh, subjective storytelling to like a more objective approach. Like, um, and, um, so like, I haven't really seen like, normally when you hear about like cults it's like in a podcast or a documentary and they are very like objective and like true crimey true crimey mm -hmm. um i've never really seen like a lot of like these kind of stories in a comic book format and you do deal with some heavy topics and it kind of reminded me of like how a mouse uses that like the comic book format and then anthropomorphic mice and cats to represent the holocaust to make it kind of like easier for people to like approach um i did you i kind of felt like that was kind of going on too with like when i was reading it as a comic and seeing things like they don't look like photos of humans or like cartoons and basically some of the tougher things um did you feel like there was any other bit like benefits from telling these stories in a comic format that you other people might like other formats might not have been able to like get at or you wouldn't be able to do in other formats i i think that comics engage the reader in a like in a particular way and i for me at least as a reader like i find myself so drawn to this way of storytelling it's it's very easy to get drawn into these stories and these characters and what they're going through in a way that some sometimes uh is maybe there's there's a it's a little harder with uh with um really like academic text or 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 something like that i mean documentaries I also love because they have that visual aspect and you, it, you you feel really drawn into the story and you get to hear the voices of the people involved and you really feel like you get an insider's perspective. So like at the visual aspect, I think helps um, draw people in. And I, I think it is um, probably a little e easier to take as a drawing. Sometimes the really... Um, graphic and traumatic stuff like like the photos like looking at the the photos from the Jonetown massacre is a uh, is hard um looking at a drawing of it is a little easier um it's it's not quite as a gut punch to to look at a drawing so i think it does allow you to um kind of explore these these darker topics in a way that doesn't um doesn't quite uh overwhelm you in the way that like maybe seeing graphic color photos would. Yeah. I actually was, uh, after reading the Nexium, um, mm -hmm. story, I had to go look him up because I was so intrigued by how they represented him in the comic, uh, with the big head. And like, obviously he cared a lot about his hair. And so I was like, well, what does this guy actually look like? So I ended up going to find <laughs> what these people actually looked like, because I, thought that the way that they were represented in the comics was so, uh, was an interesting choice. <laughs> actually kind of, yeah. Um, I actually, um, after reading it and I read, reading the Jonestown story, I, I forgot, I was, there's a movie I wanted to watch that finally got on streaming called the sacrament. And I forgot that it was like, 
it's it's not a documentary, but it's like a guy, a fictionalized version of uh, Jonestown, like pretty like at shot for shot accurate using the same beats as what actually happened with the reporters showing up. And I was watching this horror film and I was just thinking of like, I don't need to see this. Like, I didn't need to see this. I know it's all fictionalized, but even though the, these are actors, I was like, I <laughs> it was like too gory even for me just watching like a, a movie I thought was a horror film. And it was like because it's real yeah it's yeah so even when it's fictionalized you know it's real and it's heartbreaking yeah Yeah. i saw that i think it's a great movie (laughs) yeah um ty west the yeah the director it's it's basically they tell the story without actually telling it i guess i don't even know if you i wouldn't call it a biopic because it's like yeah i think a horror a horror film is is the right thing to call it yeah (laughs) With it, with this journalist journalistic aspect to it, that uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. well, on that note, <laughs> um, we will go ahead and take a short break, um, and when we come back, we've got a lot more questions for Robin Chapman. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you. Did you know that the Wichita Public Library offers book sets for checkout? You and your book club can borrow up to 10 copies of a single title. You can even schedule the whole year in advance. And there are more than 100 titles to choose from. Newer titles, older titles, fiction, nonfiction. Find the full list online at wichitalibrary.org and call us at 316-261-8500 to schedule yours today. And we're back with Robin Chapman. She is the editor for the anthology American Cult. Yes. Um, now, Robin, there are a lot of pop culture references in these stories, such as the Don't Worry, Be Happy um, lyric, the Drink the Kool-Aid, you know, those kinds of things. Um, were there any pop culture references that surprised you? And how do you think that cultures and their so- or no, not cultures, cults, that would be an interesting topic about how cult is a shortened version of culture, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you think that cults and their stories continue to influence our culture? I I don't think I was that surprised because what I knew about cults is that um, they often um, attract some some very smart, talented, sometimes affluent people, sometimes people who are are very connected in the world. So the the idea that you um, might have like, a musician with a, a a like hit song on the radio in in, in your group um that didn't startle me too much because there's a there's a lot of that like um uh let me just uh, i'm just gonna click quickly like look at open my book and, and look at some examples. i was also taken by the cheesecake factory connection oh yeah yeah like the cheesecake like, yeah yeah, um, yeah that's that's another one like that the the founder of the cheesecake factory was very involved in this this group that um um, the name is 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 kind of uh, slipping my mind. Is it? It's a um, Sufism. Sufism reoriented or something like that. Uh, uh, let me see if I can I can find it and oh, come back to you. Here. But yeah, like it, it it that you find that again and again that um, these groups they don't just attract like you know random outsider loonies or something. They're these like um, these. Like, uh, yeah, these these groups often attract people who with like um, published authors, academics, like smart people who are involved in the, the culture at large. So it, it made sense to me. Um, and also some of these stories, like the Jonestown story was such a big news story that it how could it not affect the culture? Like it, it, it makes sense. So one thing really fascinating about some of these stories is some of the celebrity connections that cult leaders often have. We kind of mentioned this, like what might draw celebrities to be drawn to these leaders do you think these celebrity connections are intentional on the part of the leader or just another indicator of how anyone can fall into a cult i think it's both um i think certainly like a group uh benefits from having um members who for one have money like because often these cults are financed by their members so they're sometimes all the members need to um, like really allocate all their finances to the, the group. And so it makes sense that they would be attracted to members who have a lot in the bank. Um, 
and uh, and and also sometimes they w- want to have a representative of their group that like is in the culture and respected in the culture. It make it normalizes mm-hmm. them. But I think also it's just that you know celebrities like a lot of them um, are searching for the same thing every everyone else is looking to better their life. Look, um, looking for uh, a higher path, looking for a better way to exist in the world. Um, and maybe, yeah, looking for a way to improve themselves and this, the group they find might be offering that for them or, or <laughs> claiming to offer it. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, we've got to have a way to make money, right? I feel like greed was kind of the basis for a lot of these, like some of them may have started with higher ideals, but it was very quickly overtaken by some greed is how mm-hmm. I, I saw a lot of those stories. Yeah, I think it also just like a greed for wealth, but maybe even more greed uh, for power. Yeah, like yeah. um I think once they knew what it was like to be really embraced as a leader and even a messiah, like for a certain type of person that becomes like kind of almost addictive, like that like that that sort of life um and uh they'll they'll do whatever they can to maintain it. I almost saw like some similarities because I used to watch a lot of VH1 behind the music and it seems like rock bands are also kind of have the same yeah. trajectory. Like they're a group of guy, people and then they get too powerful. And the <laughs> one guy be, is like obviously the leader and then like everyone either just like leaves or <laughs> something bad happens. And I was, that's when I kind of like saw that parallel there a couple times with some of these. And obviously, like with the Manson family, where like Charles Manson was trying to be a musician, like yeah. 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 And then there was all these musicians who were involved in that story that had interactions with Mans- Manson, or Manson showed up at like you know this this pool party um, with all these celebrities, like musicians. Um, yeah, I mean, like I I think some sometimes uh, celebrities or musicians are, or they might be open to a more alternative way of living, or you know you know counterculture and so they aren't put off by the idea of this like community that's on the outside do you think that we're more susceptible to i mean i I guess the only real recent one was nexium right some of them still continue there's still some that show up in your on your book like some of the the kind of offshoots of more mainstream religions but like do you think that social media, the internet has played into how people are preyed upon with the cults? Um, I mean, have you seen I mean, I, anything of that in your research? I think um, probably a better example of that is how the internet is a tool that can be used for groups that are maybe not 100% a cult, but are like a community outside of the mainstream. Like when you think of all the folks who showed up and stormed the Capitol on January 6th and how much the internet and, um, you know, social media to, to one extent, but also just a lot of these, um, online programs and such that you can use to message people. And then you can use to have a, a message board, like basically a way you can communicate and find people in these fringe groups. Like, I'm sure it was harder before the internet existed. Like, um, you probably ha- probably had to really dig to find these these fringe hate groups, um, and the, and maybe it would be hard to like get to one or to like you know get to a meeting or something like that. But now, like you know, a couple of clicks, so you can, you can just have all this access to all this like fringe hate material, um, and that's I think it's cult adjacent. Whether it's a cult, like I guess is is up you know, whether those groups are cults is kind of a, uh, an opinion, but, uh, but it is, you know, dangerous and it is, it does have, does fall prey to some of the same problems that, uh, you find in a, in a cult. I never thought about it, but like, like, honestly, like cults are people that have shared ideas. If technology is accelerating at an exponential level to let people communicate, then <laughs> We should like eventually like exponentially have more cults because people are able to connect faster, like through social media. So it makes sense that like we have more cults now than ever because people are like, 
I guess I I don't know. I can't I can't yeah. say if we have more more or not. Like we certainly have a lot of fringe groups and fringe communities. Um, Tribalism, have, I think, is yeah. like the operative term you see a lot of articles about, like increased tribalism. So, yeah, I guess um, some of these groups and communities might not have the organization um, involved to take it or the leadership that kind of may take it to the next level of as a cult. Um, but like the same, a lot of the same dangers are there. I mean, when you think about QAnon or something like, um, I don't know if there's really an organization to the group where there's leadership that, that in membership, but like a lot of the same dangerous thinking and outcomes you find with, with that, you know, it feels very cultish. Yeah, it's so, harder to have an authoritarian leader when it's all uh, seemingly anonymous. Yeah. Mm -hmm, right. So there's like um, a few stories that you in the anthology focus on cults that branch from mainstream religions, FLDS, Orthodox Judaism and Westboro Baptist Church, just to name a few, mm -hmm. um, especially with Orthodox Judaism. Did you take pause when including these in your anthology? I know you kind of talked about the selection process earlier. Um, it seems like there can be a fine line between a cult and an organized religion. Uh, did you like have trouble finding where that line is at all with like? Um, well, for that story, I definitely didn't think I would have that group in the book. Like I certainly wasn't seeking out um, a cartoonist to cover this book, this story, um, the the uh, like ultra Orthodox Judaism. Um, I don't think I did consider that a cult. Uh, but the the cartoonist, uh, the author of that story, Lonnie Mann, he reached out to me and he said, hey, I want to tell my story. Um, and I said, well, let's talk. Like, um, here's how I define a cult. Does that, does this, does your experience really fit in that? And he says, you know, yeah, it does because of, you know, because of this and because of that and how, how um, I felt really pressured to, you know, live this certain life and um it was very hard as for me as a as a gay gay boy and then eventually a, a gay man to to live um within all these rules and pressures and um and it, he feels like he was lied to by by his religion that like really that, that and he was controlled and um so basically he just made a case he said this is why the, this this my experience fits um and I, you know, I was like, well, um, I really don't disagree. Like, I, I think you make a good case. So let's, uh, I'll let, yeah. Why don't you tell your story? I don't think I would have, I, I don't think I would have let anybody who hadn't from outside the group, from outside the group, tell that story. Like, um, but since he, it was his lived experience, I think that, and he had a, a good point. I, I thought, yeah, let's, let's include it. Yeah. It yeah. was a little more. Like this was my version of the story. And so you can't argue with somebody else's like experience, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's not like, well, this isn't a cult because this is his experience. But also um, you had mentioned who else had their lived experience. Uh, who was the other author? Uh, his name's Jesse Lambert. And which, um, which just, cult was that? So I'm pulling up his um, story. His, his story was called, That's Not What We're Called. And... The group is uh, really it almost doesn't even have a name, but it's it's referred to the Sullivanians. Is it the sex cult? It is sort of a sex cult. Like I think, <laughs> I'm going to try. I always get the name. The name's kind of hard for me to say. Sullivan Sullivanians. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Um, but it was it was a group in New York City that um, wasn't okay. really uh, focused around a religion, but more about like. Um, a very like leftist political bent and like this uh, psychotherapy practice that they were involved in. And, and it was a group where um, the membership was encouraged and maybe, I, I don't know if the word is, was forced is right, but pressured into um, coupling as uh, the leadership suggested they should. Um, and, uh, and so there was, uh, you know, it wasn't a monogamous cult. That's, that's for sure. It was, um, there was, you know, coupling happening between different members. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, and yeah, a lot of the members were, you know, very smart people, academics, um, intellectuals, uh, and they were, you know, gathered around this leadership that was, um, presenting this, this 
this like concept of psychotherapy that was like true and a way of raising their children, which was more, more right than like what the mainstream was doing. Um, yeah, that's so yeah, Jesse Lambert grew up in, um, that group and he's working on a larger graphic novel about that story. And this was like a portion of it. Uh, I think it's, I'm really excited to see where it leads. Cool. We'll look for that. The other one I wanted to ask you about specifically was the Westboro Baptist church. Uh, one we're from Kansas. That's our resident, um, resident, one of the resident cults. Um, I'm I'm hesitant to call it a cult, but yeah. just because I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. But um, that one was particularly heartbreaking. And I wondered if that young girl who was kicked out, spoilers, um, if that's a true story. That is a true story. That's one of the um, stories where it, it was uh, writing about a, a real person and, and she did write a a, a memoir. And um, so I think that was a, a lot of the source material was her, like that memoir, her, her own experience. It's, it's also the longest story in the anthology. I think it might be 21 pages. So it's a pretty long story about um, the girl, um, her family coming into the cult. So she wasn't born into the Westboro Baptist Church, like a lot of um, the members are. She was, her, her family entered it. And, um, but she really grew up in it. And so it was her community and she got kicked out as a young woman. And that was very hard. Like she didn't have anybody else. Um, she didn't really know how to live outside of that group. Well, and I think it was particularly heartbreaking how like the, the sister who she, you know, spent all that time with, and she was very close to, and she's walking out of the, the room and she's smiling and she's like, can we go get ice cream? <laughs> They yeah. just left her. They just left her. Oh, yeah, man. J- yeah, JT Yost was the author of that one. I think he did a really good job. It was very impactful. But I think that gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that insider perspective. Like, how can you... I mean, you can't argue with somebody else's experiences. And and they were left dead or completely heartbroken or alone. Um and so they're very real consequences to these stories. All right, Robin, what is it about cults that fascinates us as a society? I mean, I, again, like on our on a base level, we're always attracted to those like um, scandal stories, like this stories about, you know, murder, you know, stories about sex, like, you know, that, you know, it, we can't help but like, sort of be intrigued by the, those, those stories. And these cult stories often do have a lot of that. So, so there's that aspect. Um, And also, I think that a lot of us are just interested in what it's like to live a a different experience. Um, uh, I've always been interested in what it would be like to be um, a nun in a, in a, in a, in a cloistered community. Like that experience mm. is so different from anything I've ever lived. What, uh, like it, and maybe it's a little bit of that. Like, what is it like to be inside this world? That's so different from, from the way I live. Um, so I, maybe, maybe those two, two things. Um, and that they're, 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 you know, these are often kind of bizarre stories. Like they're, they really, cause us to wonder and like why and ask questions like why did was you know was jonestown was that really suicide i mean not personally i don't think so um was that murder um but what about heaven's gate was that suicide i think it was i think it was different um but but if if you did believe like the heaven's gate members uh chose to end their lives why why did they do that like a lot of people just can't even imagine like how could, you know, over 20 people decide to choose their lives? Like, why didn't they say, no, I, I quit. You know, <laughs> this is, this, this group has gone too far. Like, yeah, I guess the why of it is a, is a, or like how, and sometimes, you know, you know, again, these stories are so strange and sometimes the way these people live is so very different than how we live. You kind of like, wow, how did they, why did they choose to do that? How did they get to that point? why are they living this way? Um, yeah. Trying to understand something that like really is so outside of our experience. It might not make sense to us. 
I think that's a really good answer. <laughs> um, you mentioned Heaven's Gate, and that's the one, the story that you worked on. Um, was there any reason why that other, like, that you were, you wanted to work do that mm. that cult specifically and um, oh go ahead go oh, ahead. um yeah i guess there's a couple of reasons one there's just a lot of material to dig into from that from the, that cult because um they recorded so much of what they did so there's lots i mean they recorded their exit videos as they called them their the goodbyes they gave before they um, ended their lives um and yeah so there was just a lot to dig into um where you could see the humanity of them like the especially the exit videos where the each most of them not everybody did an exit video but um once it did they got in front of a camera and some some of them told a, a joke some of them told the reason why they're doing this a lot of them said they were so happy that they've never been so happy they can't wait to, um to move on to this, the next step um and they feel so lucky to be in this group and watching those videos, like these people, they seemed very kind and sweet and gentle and nerdy. I like that too. Like there's a, there's, you know, this science fiction aspect to that group um, that uh, as a fellow nerd, I could kind of like relate to like the, the, the Heaven's Gate folks seemed like there was a lot of sweet, gentle, nerdy, smart folks um, living together in a peaceful way. And I was, I guess I was, I was drawn to that. Like I, I wanted to know more about these people. But do you think in that kind of a situation, like Jonestown, totally different. <laughs> um, well, potentially totally different, but the the story in your book makes a very strong case that it was murder and not suicide. Um, the, with Heaven's Gate, like, where does the blame then lie, right? Does it lie with these people who thought that they were um, saying goodbye and they were going on to bigger and better things? Does it lie with the leader? I can't remember his name right now. George um, Applewhite. Or yeah, Marshall Applewhite. Marshall Applewhite, okay. yeah. Um, who convinced them of this? I mean, did he really think that he... Because he didn't seem to be in it for the money. That was different, right? He may have had greed of like influence but not i don't know that their story was particularly just like it's kind of sad yeah it is it is sad um i i mean i i don't know of course what what his what marshall applewhite's like motivation was i pretty sure he believed what he said like he certainly did and his life like like the rest like i um i so it i he lived um i think more or less, like I could be wrong. So I feel like if anyone wants to correct me, I, I totally understand. Uh, but uh, I think that Marshall Applewhite lived a lot like his followers, which was a very humble, like um, almost monk-like existence, where they they dressed in these like um, kind of like uh, unisex um, outfits. With they they cut their hair. They um, you know they did work to support the group. Like they. Um, and they they didn't they like didn't have a like personal wealth um so i i mean i from what i from my perspective is that he he was um not searching for financial gain i i think that he probably in a lot of these folks i would think especially if you believe it enough to end your life along with everyone else like it i it's kind of makes a case that uh that you believe what you're preaching and that probably, um, you know, you've just been caught up in this sort of idea of like being a messiah um, and like, like imagine what that does to your head. Man. Yeah. It's when you have to just kind of sit with for a while. Yeah. Hey, um, so uh, thank you again for joining us today. Yeah. Um, this so, was fascinating. So yeah, thank this you is, very much. yeah. Thank you oh, so thank much. You. Um, so what's next for you? Are there any projects you're working on and where can people find more of your work? Um, well, I, so I run a small press called Paper Rocket Mini Comics and American Cult was co-published by Paper Rocket and also Silver Sprocket. We, we, it was an accident, but we rhyme. Um, and, but like Paper Rocket Mini Comics, uh, we continue to put out um, 
comics and publications every year. The thing we're doing right now is called the Mini Memoir Project. It's a 13-volume series of short comics about uh, an experience in childhood. So they're, they're autobio, they're, they're mini memoirs. Um, so 13 different authors, each writing about an experience from their childhood. So we're on issue five. Um, so we're about oh, cool. ha- um, almost halfway through. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'll be doing for the next maybe year and a half. Um, and beyond that, Paper Rocket, uh, I don't think we have a next project, but you know, I've been self-publishing um, for for a long time, and I think I'll keep doing it. I, it's fun. <laughs> are the auto the autobiography mini memoirs are they available as oh, a yeah. zine online or um... yeah they're they're avail- available in print. Um, so Paper Rocket Comic paperrocketcomics.com is my website, and then there's the store is paperrocketcomics.storeandb.com. I'm, pretty sure that's the right <laughs> but uh, there's also a link on on paperrocketcomics.com cool well we'll definitely include that link in our show notes for anyone listening that wants to check out more yeah, robin yeah. thanks so much for joining oh. us today yeah it was really it was really nice to talk to you talk to you okay. thank you so much oh thank you <laughs>
There are three main narrators, and as the events unfold, a network of corruption is revealed. Even at 550 pages, it was a page-turner. The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin I remember reading this over and over when I was little, but it was out of print until recently. Sixteen heirs are called to a reading of a will, but only one can win it all. Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism by Amanda Montell an informative book and shocking to know how many cults exist. I Have Some Questions For You by Rebecca Mackay. It's a good one. Years later, a podcaster delves into the murder of a former roommate at her boarding school. She wonders if the right person was convicted and looks at the sexual abuse and murder of women and what has changed and not changed. The Collective by Allison Galen. This book I found very intriguing. I listened to it and really enjoyed the narration. Unfollow, A Memoir of Loving and Leaving the Westboro Baptist Church by Megan Phelps Roper. It was surprisingly interesting, even with all the discussions of Bible verses. Yeah, wow, what a cool episode. I thought it was really cool how Robin went into a lot of the backstory about how these stories came to be. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting that um, we've interviewed a lot of authors on this show, but, but to hear from like an editor of an anthology was also kind of like an interesting uh, take. So. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Daniel, is there any cults you think you would join? Oh, that's easy. Friends of the Public Library. Um, that's not a cult. There's no authoritarian leader. Listen, if you say so, I've been to those members-only book sale nights. Pretty wild stuff. Oh my gosh. So you just want to join it so you can get early access to the book sale? Pretty much. Everything's always picked over by the time I get there. <laughs> How about you? Well, it's hard for me to say. Uh, so honestly, I'm surprised at how many cults are vegan. I got more vegan options for cults to join than I do for eating in my own hometown. Hey, uh, a list of books discussed in today's episode can be found in the accompanying show notes. To request any of the books heard about in today's episode, visit wichitalibrary.org or call us at 316-261-8500. Thank you to Robin Chapman for joining us for today's recording. We'd also like to thank those who shared recommendations for today's category. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes up to the production crew and podcast team. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag Read ICT Challenge on Facebook and click join. And don't forget to log your books in the reading tracker app, Beanstack. Each month you log a book in the challenge, you're eligible to win fun prizes. If you need any assistance signing up or logging books, give us a call. Reach us on chat or stop by the nearest branch. You can follow this podcast through your Spotify app or stream episodes on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe and share with all your friends. See you next time. Have a good day. Thank you.